I'm Francisca Kakwafos and welcome to Joy News Today. The Ministry of Power has denied publications suggesting that the Ameri Power deal was signed with a dubious company and at an inflated cost of $510 million. A statement issued by Power Minister Dr. Kwabna Donko described the publication by the Norwegian newspaper VG as false, misleading and a gross mis misrepresentation of the facts. My colleague Francis Aban of the Energy Desk has been speaking with the chairman of the Ameri Group. Sending a lot of mails to the uh, chief executive and board member of Ameri Group LLC. He's called Ziad Barakat. Now, I asked him about the contract, uh, the matter about the cost involved, mm -hmm. the $510 million and what goes into it. Now, he explained that uh, they have awarded the contract to Mecta for over $350 million, which includes turbines, balance of plant installation, and commissioning of the project. Now, the operation and maintenance costs, financial costs, political risk insurance, management cost and return on investment is on top. As to what this particular sentence means, I don't know. I've been trying to get some of these on it and very little I'm getting right now. But it says that the repayment of our investment as per the agreement is $510 million used over a period of five years to be paid through energy generated by the power plant sold to end user at current market price of electricity duly approved by the regulatory authority. On the matter of Omar Farouk and the question that I've been asked about why we are dealing with a man like this and why even the company hired him to do a job. We're told by the correspondents that he's worked with them for only six months. Says Mr. Farouk worked around six months for the company and resigned as he was offered some bigger business opportunities. And during the time of his engagement, he had no outstanding issues with any authority and that a complete background check was conducted. The news about him, and these are the words of Ziad Barakat, says the news about him being wanted is very recent and learned through media. We still have not seen any evidence of this fact. So what it means is that from January till June this year, this man, Farouk, was working, was working for, for Ameri Group LLC. But the contract, is, it, it, it's only stated that he was a witness, but if you do checks online, it shows that this man actually worked as, as the chief executive officer of the company. Again, I asked the CEO the question as to in what capacity he served for Ameri Group. Up until now, he has not responded to that statement. He is not. But on the other issues he raises here, he's clarifying that the government of Ghana has not paid them any money at all for this project, but will start to pay only after the project becomes operational and have produced electricity for at least 30 days under the agreement duly ratified by the Parliament of Ghana. Again, there's a contradiction here because in this same statement, he says that uh, all the machinery and equipment has been paid for and have already arrived to the project site, currently being installed, and will be operational by the end of the year. So the question is, who paid for the machinery and equipment? Stay a little while longer on that topic, because Vice Chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament says the House did no wrong in approving the Ameri Power deal with government. The cost of the plants and the ownership have become a matter of national interest, with calls for the Power Minister to be hauled before Parliament. But Vice Chairman of the Committee, Adam Mutawaki, Mutawakilu, uh, beg your pardon, says the House will take such a decision if it becomes necessary. Elton John Brobe joins us from Parliament. Elton, good afternoon to you. Now, this controversial Ameri contract was earlier this year brought to Parliament and reportedly spent six minutes, uh, the House spent six minutes uh, to pass it. What can you tell us about that? Well, it is absolutely true. As part of the, the, the motion on that particular subject uh, lasted for just five minutes. Uh, on the 20th of March, when the then chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee, uh, James uh, presented the report of the, uh, of the committee to the House. Now, what happened was that when the matter was presented to the House, the Speaker normally will allow for debate on that particular document. Uh, but when Clutches of Wukan, the then chairman of the committee, presented the document to the House and the Speaker invited comments, nobody uh, in the House at that particular moment, you know, uh, spoke to it. So once there was no objection, there was no concern, there was nothing from any member on that particular motion, the Speaker, the speaker was left with no option than to call uh, for the adoption of the report. So that's how come uh, motion on the adoption of the Mines and Energy Committee report on the, on the agreement between American Group and government lasted for just five minutes. But let me also say that before the report was presented to Parliament, the committee had had extensive discussions on the document itself, and I'm told that that actually travelled more than 
a month before it was eventually presented to Very well. uh, the plenary for decision to be taken on it. So it is not really an out of place matter. Very well. And it's interesting that there was no objection uh, at the committee level. Uh, and when it came to Parliament, five minutes uh, was spent on it. No objection. Uh, how then does the committee say that they did no wrong when at this point in time there are questions, so many questions about the cause, about issues of fraud. How do they justify this claim of not doing anything wrong? Well, according to the, the vice chair of the committee, who was actually the vice chairman at that particular time, Adam Mita Wakilu, uh, the, when the minister, Dr. Fernando, presented the matter before them, a matter from now learning that it was actually an executive approval that was presented to the mines, that was presented to, to parliament, with the speaker referred to the mines and energy committee. Now, they had three options available to them at that particular time. Uh, the renting of the power generating plants and also whether they, they, they should go for the build, own, transfer and operate. At the end of it, they settled on the build, own and transfer uh, bit. So as far as they are concerned, they did their work well and there is absolutely nothing wrong with what they did as members of the Mines and Energy Company. What, what I'm learning right now, I'm actually speaking to you from the offices of the deputy minority leader in Parliament. What I'm learning right now is that uh, the, the, the leadership of the minority group in Parliament, they have called on the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee, Katie Hammond, to appear before the minority group. They don't want to say anything relating to this particular matter until they've been formally briefed by, by Katie Hammond, who is the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee, because according to them, they have so many issues relating to the American group and, and also car power. But they want formal briefing from their representative from the Mines and Energy Committee, and then they will take a decision. Who was, and, and Mr. KC Hammond Elton was in Parliament to pass this deal, correct? Yes, he was. Okay, now we, we are hearing uh, that there's a possibility of um, the Prime Minister, Kobna Donko, being hauled to Parliament. Can you confirm, will that happen? No, no decision as of now has been taken. I mean, the, again, the Deputy Chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee is saying that uh, the, the committee will meet today as a matter of fact. They are meeting to consider estimates by the Ministry of Petroleum and the Ministry of Power. Now, at this meeting this afternoon, they will discuss this matter, and if it becomes necessary for them to invite Dr. Kobna Donko, to give them further, further particulars on this particular matter in question, they will not, uh, they will not hesitate to do that. All right, we'll leave it here. Thank you very much, Elton John Brobe, parliamentary correspondent. And still on the issue with the Ameri plans, the Africa Center for Energy Policy has been raising some more questions about the recent contracts Ghana signed uh, in the energy sector. Ben Boache of ASAP was on the Super Morning Show on Joy FM and, uh, earlier and says that Ghana has, done, uh, has not done much due diligence in these contracts. If you look at what was presented to Parliament, and the statement that has come out today is marks of deception because if you told parliament that it's going to cost us uh, 411 million and now you are agreeing that the cost of the plant is uh, uh, 210 then you did not help parliament to even do their own due diligence mm. are you happy with their uh, explanation of all the issues or do you do you still have questions I think there are, there are questions. I mean, it contradicts, like I said, what was given to Parliament, just as you read. Uh, you know, the impression has been created that we are not paying uh, for the badges outright, which is accurate, uh, but we are going to pay. Uh, uh, VRA is supposed to put up an escrow through which these payments will be made. So they don't care whether you're able to uh, uh, take your tariffs or not. They didn't negotiate for tariff. That is our own arrangement with PURC, which is also going to uh, be fed into uh, uh, the tariff. So we would need to be able to pay 850,000 per day per unit, you know, multiply uh, uh, across to the year as 102 million. And that is our liability to Ameri, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the plans that you are bringing here. So we are going to pay these amounts uh, over the period of five years. The options for us, was that we could have bought this outright. I mean, we are a sovereign nation. If we wanted really to get these badges outright, we didn't need to go to GE, as uh, the minister said, would delay the process. There are agents across the world who have these plants in stock, brand new. We could have contacted any of them and bought it outright. 
if you didn't have the money and you have 102 or 118 million dollars per annum uh, to give to these people you could have used that amount to buy what you can buy you know rather than committing annually to uh, 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 these budgets another alternative is that if you look at our power plants many of them are used plants and if we wanted to buy used plants we could have gotten these plants at seven million dollars ten million dollars per unit that 102, uh, 118 million could have bought all the capacity that these people are bringing in for 510 million if we wanted to opt for used ones. You know, so these were the options that we had available to us, and we didn't choose any of them than to give our Mary a free 160 million dollars for bringing playing a middleman's role, and that is what is sad. Away from that, some executives of the National Democratic Congress in the uh, Klote, or Klote rather constituency have sued Zanetto Rawlings. Kobna Chenchenhene, uh, my colleague, joins me in the studio with details. Kobna, so what more can you tell us from that? Well, you know, uh, this suit was filed by uh, seven people. Now, let, let me mention the background to this whole issue. There are four people who were contesting uh, the legitimacy of uh, Dr. Zanetta Rawlings to contest on the party's tickets in the Clotic Rawlings constituency. Now, uh, initially, they wrote to the Electoral Commission seeking clarification as to whether indeed this her lady... name was in the voters' exactly, register. Exactly, whether we did have a name in the register. And then we are told the EC wrote back to them, telling them that, well, we can't give you these particulars. These are biometric details of uh, a Ghanaian citizen. We can't just go ahead and give you that detail, unless, of course, we have uh, a court writ. Okay, then after that, they, they petitioned the party and uh, there's a copy of the petition, uh, the response that was given to them. And these four people here are Joseph Nakubotri, Jacob Amin, Alhaji, Mohammed Mahmoud, and Reverend Michael Kwabna Nye Soa. So let me just bring you excerpts of that letter that the party wrote to them. Now, the, the letter says, We have received your petition dated December 2, 2015, at the regional executive meeting held on Wednesday, December 9. And uh, we deliberated on your petition and comment as follows. Now, the first point here is that, uh, that all, all the contestants for the Clote Cole constituency were vetted by the vetting committee and cleared to contest the primaries, which took place on November 21. So... Uh, and the second point here is that, uh, that as far as the Greater Accra Regional Executives uh, are concerned, Dr. Zanetto Ajima Rollins is the parliamentary candidate for the Clote Colley constituency. So this was the response the party gave to them. And this was dated 10th December 2015. That's last, last Thursday. And then when they got this, they then moved to court on 11th of December to file this rate. And now there are three parties in this suit. Uh, they jointly sued. Dr. Zanetto Rollins as the second defender, but the first defendant here is the National Democratic Congress, and then they added the Electoral Commission. And they are seeking quite a number of things. Let me quickly just come to this and uh, what they want. Based on this suit, uh, they just want some clarification on a number of things. Uh, again, they raise issues about uh, the qualification criteria, and it says uh, whoever is to stand on the ticket of the party needs to uh, point five years says be qualified in accordance with the 1992 national constitution to be elected as a member of parliament something they say uh, dr zanetta rollins falls short of and again uh, they go down and talk about quite a number of things uh, there's another point here that speaks of the plaintiffs further say that among the qualification and eligibility criteria for a person to be a member of parliament is that the person must be a registered voter within the meaning of Article 9, 94, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution at the time of contesting for the party's parliamentary primary. So that is the situation now. This is what they are contesting. But we're looking forward to seeing what the next move is now. Definitely. Thank you very much, Kabna Chenchahene, for that. From the NDC, let's go to the People's National Convention, PNC. Because over the weekend, they, uh, the party went through Congress to elect national executives to steer the affairs of the party ahead of the 2016 elections. Uh, the party elected four-time flag bearer uh, to lead it into the 2016 elections. General Secretary-elect of the PNC, Atik Mohammed, has been explaining what the outcome of the Congress means to them and the 2016 elections. The kind of campaign we intend to execute this time around, it is going to be a campaign that has never been witnessed in the history of the party. In the last elections that uh, Dr. Obama contested, and I think this is a collective failure. We were unable to package the message and the messenger in a manner that, you know, Ghanaians would buy without hesitation. So, so you believe the PNC can uh, possibly even win next year's general elections? 
exactly the case, my brother. So you are going to win next year's elections? Sorry? You are going to win next year's elections? I, that I can assure you because, you know why? Ghanaians are tired of these two alternatives. Mm. And because the media have helped these two parties to create the impression that there are only two alternatives in Ghana. So you either are MP2 or you are NDT. That is something we are going to work hard to change. And once we change that, Ghanaians have been for an alternative to the NDC and MP for a very long time. We are now giving them a cause to know that indeed the PNC has arrived. And look, once they have that realization, that indeed there is a third, a third more uh, appealing alternative, they will abandon the NDC, they will abandon the NDP. So me, I am assuring you that we will get more seats in Parliament. We are likely to win the next election mm -hmm. from the next government, God willing. He also said 2012 flag bearer Hassan Ayaraga's announced exit from the party will have no impact on their activities. Consider this is a game of numbers, but sometimes you are better off by some numbers. And I, I dare say that if Ayaraga decides to put this party, I'm not sure he's going with any majority. Indeed, if we take his own results, if he is any indication, he himself won't have contested. His results were not even enough to win some. So, and I'm telling you that hardcore members, some hardcore members of the party, that is not even good and not good. They thought there were some issues with, with, with the flag bearer and, and, and the entire party. So for us, if it is just to win, I mean to quit. In as much as politics of our numbers, uh, we would only wish him well. And I can assure you that, look, why? We've had, even though I don't know what, you know, when we meet, the decision is going to be. But if please, I will not have any success at all. I do not know what uh, the leadership when we meet is going to extend to him. But uh, I don't know. Because if after losing an election, the first thing you do is... I wouldn't say he doesn't bring anything. I mean, it would be unfair to say so. But as to whether his living will cost this party so much, is, is what I'm talking about. Mm. We have an agenda ahead of us. And look at the team. We are going to focus on the agenda. Uh, people have left parties, formed even new parties. At the end of the day, those parties went ahead to win elections. Mm. I do not know what the leadership is going to decide eventually. But I'm sure when we meet, whether some talking should be done to him or, or not, that is for the group to decide. But I, I don't think that it should be calculated to mean that if he does decide to quit, the PNC is going to grind to the horse or the PNC is going to collapse the ground. Mm. As a matter of fact, we have an agenda, and the team is more than poised to ensure that. Uh, I mean, look, the chairman is a very young, strong man, you know, full of ideas and so on. You look at the other executives, very young, ready to work. And so, if we say to ourselves, this is what we are going to do, and which indeed we have told ourselves, that we'll revive the party, we'll get more seats, we'll make it attractive, and so on and so forth, we'll build structures. This is Joy News Today with me, Francisca Kakra Foss. And let's take a break right now. We'll be back with more stories. Hello again. You're watching Joy News Today with me, Francisca Kakra Forsen. Now, police in Ashanti region have arrested four persons, including a Bokinabe, for possessing and transporting a cache of ammunition to Niger. The, su the suspects, three of whom are Ghanaians, were picked up upon a tip-off. The suspects were arrested at a house in Alaba, a suburb of Kumasi. It is the biggest arms haul in the history of the Kumasi police. Now, the arms retrieved include 20 AK-47 guns, machine guns, and countless ammunition. The Ashanti Region Police addressed the media today. Uh, and correspondent Nuruddin Mohammed joins us on the telephone with details. Nuruddin, good afternoon to you. Now, what more has the police been telling you at this conference? Well, uh, Francisca, 72-year-old uh, Moro Chata uh, is, is, in, is a Burkina Bay, and we were told that he actually gets his suppliers from other West African countries, including Africa, Burkina, Niger, uh, and some other places. And he has been supplying weapons to criminals in the region, according to the police. And that was why four other people were also arrested, so four other I mean, suspected armed robbers were arrested in connection, and in connection with this, 
and according to the police, they are uh, they actually purchased the weapons from Chata uh, Chata Moro. So uh, what happened was that uh, about two months ago, the police uh, embarked on the operation uh, upon a tip off that they got from some people, and so Chata was arrested on Friday at Akwatia Line in Kumasi. So uh, the police are actually telling the public to cooperate with them, provide them with further information, information that will lead to the arrest of any other criminal in the region in order to preserve the peace that uh, we, we, we enjoy in the region. And have you been able to gauge reactions of uh, residents uh, to this news? This is said to be the biggest uh, ammunition bust in, in, the, in the region. Francisca, you know, before the police even called for the press briefing, uh, we, 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 there was this, I mean, pictures of these weapons were circulating in the social media, especially on WhatsApp, and the residents were actually, I mean, surprised. Uh, they were wondering how these, where these weapons are coming from and where they were being transported to. And so the fear was like, hey, uh, people were, I mean, actually, uh, were actually afraid. They were fears among residents in the Kumasi metropolis, to be precise. And so there was so many, so much talk about where it was being transferred to, where it is from, and I mean, so many people talking about it. Uh, but now that the police has come out to, I mean, uh, tell us what actually happened, how they managed to get these weapons, and what Moro Shata was actually, where he was actually getting the weapons, I think residents are now okay with the explanation gi given by the police. But uh, they want the police to also be up, be up with their operation to make sure they would uh, get in touch with these criminals, get them arrested, and then prosecute them. So uh, for now, I think uh, those that I have spoken with are actually uh, okay with the police explanation, but they want the police to continue with their operation. But the police also want residents to provide them with information, uh, information that will lead to arrest of these, these kind of people in the region. All right, thank you very much. That's Ashanti Region Correspondent Nuruddin Mohammed. And also, police uh, have arrested uh, the hit and run driver who killed a woman and her two grandchildren at Teshi in Accra. The suspect, 35 year old Patrick Lai, had loaded passengers from Teshi towards Accra Central when the incident happened. In spite of the sadness that is with us today, I am pleased to inform you that through that partnership with that individual member of public and the police, we've been able to identify the vehicle and the vehicle is currently at the patient division, divisional headquarters of the police. The driver too was arrested yesterday and is currently in custody. I have tasked the regional, the divisional police command to do all what it takes to send the case to court as soon as possible. But we know one thing, Christmas is just around the corner and in the course of this festive period, over the years, we've had incidents of avoidable accidents leading to loss of precious life, of which what we are witnessing today is one such incident. So we want to take this opportunity to advise all and sundry, especially drivers, be it private, driving their own private vehicles, and commercial drivers to exercise restraint during this festive period so that we end up, all of us, witnessing the festive period with our families and beyond. I lost my daughters and my mother. We are sorry about that. Very sorry. I know the past days have been very difficult for you. Very, very difficult. Very, 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 very difficult. What would you have to be done about the situation? I would I can't do. I can't do anything. I saw my daughters and my mother dead. What can I do? Can I go anywhere? I don't know what I would do. Only my God. The, sus the suspect has been arrested now. Does that bring any consolation, 
any comfort to you? Never. 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 Sad story that you saw a relative of the dead people and also you heard from the police. You're watching Joy News today with me, Francisca Kakwa Fossen. We've got lots more news coming up, plus business. You don't want to go away. Hello again, let's do business and there's a new face in the house, but I'm sure people already know you because they've yes, seen you on TV before. Yes. Emmanuel Abuaje Riafe, how are you? I'm fine, Francisca, and how are you too? I'm good. Pleased to be sharing the same platform with you. Yeah, today. likewise. <laughs> I, I understand you have some news coming from the Ghana Chamber of yes, Mines. Yes, over the weekend, the Ghana Chamber of Mines indicated that some of their members have resolved to downsize the strength of their staff, obviously because of the price, uh, global price you know, drop of minerals. That's you know, not good it's, news. It's, of course, okay. it's not good news at all. All right, take it away. Let's get the details. The Ghana Chamber of Mines has confirmed to Joy Business that some of its uh, members will carry out a restructuring exercise which might result in some layoffs. The decision has been influenced by the, t the decline prices of gold on the international market. Joy Business yesterday reported that some of the firms are considering cutting down their workforce because of the falling gold prices. Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of Mines, Suleiman Kony, says such an action would, however, be carried out with a human face. Unfortunately, um, even as we, we try to be efficient, we try to be innovative, your know, operations and all of that, it comes to a point where you now have to look at the numbers you are very in terms of employment. And, and unfortunately, sometimes it actually affects you know, employees as well. And, and these are decisions which are not taken lightly. You know, when you have a situation in a country where one employee actually taking care of close to 10 people within within his family, then you know what I'm talking about. Over and above that, the cost of you know, severing relationships with the employees and the mining that is quite that very, very high. It's quite expensive to ask, ask employees to go home. So it's, it's difficult on, on both sides, you know, holistically. And actually affects the bottom line of the company exactly. And therefore, what, what we need at this, at this moment is clear understanding and, and cooperation from the one take Chief Executive Officer of the Minerals Commission, Suleiman Kony. Now, the National Union of Aquaculture Association is calling for urgent measures to check the importation of frozen tilapia. According to the union, there's been an influx of cheap imported tilapia, and uh, despite a ban uh, forced by the country, this, it says, is causing a significant decline in the patronage of locally produced tilapia. Chairman of the union, Francis Gabra, says this is a major threat to the local industry. We have uh, players in the market that are bringing tilapia from outside and mixing it with the uh, local production. And it's very difficult on this, you know. Eventually, even the, f the frozen tilapia that comes in turns out to be cheaper than, you know, what we have over here. The cost of production is so high. So when you have somebody bringing in tilapia from China, which that's where we suspect they are bringing it from, that completely undermines, you know, uh, uh, what we are trying to do in this country to sustain that tilapia industry. So we need the authorities to come in. Still in business, government has assured Ghanaians of its determination to reduce expenditure and raise more revenue in the coming year. Speaking at the IFETCH Flamingo 2015 Awards for Business and Financial Journalist in Accra, Deputy Finance Minister Mona Koti said this is to further bring down the increasing budget deficits and avoid being downgraded by some international rating agencies. Out of the shortlisted six financial journalists, Kofia Dudomfe of Multimedia Group, particularly Lava Firm, was adjudged the Business and Financial Journalist of the Year. The five others from Bloomberg Ghana, Vasat One, Business Day, Accra Bureau of Chinua News, Agency and Economic Times also received awards for various categories. President of the Institute of Financial Journalists, IFEJ, Lloyd Evans, charged financial journalists to be more diligent in their work. Much as the government has a duty to account the good people of Ghana and how their resources are managed, it is important for us as citizens to also demand accountability from our governments. Good financial governance, if you want economic development, 
we must have good financial governance. We cannot achieve this if we do not have someone having that oversight responsibility. This job is not only for us as a media men and women. Civil society organizations, as well as our development partners, have a role to play. We in the media, of course, have to play the lead role in demanding accountability from the government. In countries that have made it, the media made it impossible for government to misbehave. But we can only take responsibility if the media itself becomes responsible. Deputy Finance Minister Mona Kote in her address also emphasized government's commitment to reduce expenditure. As we go through these challenges and as we try to narrow our budget deficit, that we are extra careful with our expenditure. I know that a lot of you thought that the 2016 budget lay more emphasis on revenue than on expenditure. But I can assure you that we've done a lot of work on expenditure. Even as we've increased revenue, we've made sure that we've decreased expenditure without compromising the quality of the service that the public service must give. This year, 2015, as at the end of September, we have been able to bring our cash deficit down to 3.1. We will end the year at 7.8 budget deficit. But that alone, nine months ending at a cash deficit of 3.1, is really big progress and that's why we refer to consolidating progress towards our bright medium term future. The Institute of Financial Journalists, IFEC, launched in July this year the second edition of the IFEC Flamingo Award for Business and Financial Journalism and in all 23 entries were received and distributed over seven award categories. Also well, that's all by way of business for this afternoon. Join the business desk again later tonight for more updates in the world of business. Back to you, Francesca. Yes, and it's already past time for lunch. Yes. I'm curious what you're going to have for lunch. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have my lunch books. Thank okay. you very much. All and right. that's Emmanuel mm. Abouadji Riafi with the latest in business. Stay tuned because Benedict Ozo is coming up with sports. <laughs> Welcome back to Joy News. Today with me, Francisca Kakra Fawson. Now, the Adome Bridge is scheduled to be reopened this week. The bridge was closed for maintenance works after some cracks were detected on portions of it, uh, which links it to the eastern uh, side, to the Volta region. Now, my colleague Latif Idrizu is at Atimpoko and joins us live with more. Latif. For renovation works to be done on the bridge. Now, the bridge, we're told, is likely to be opened on the 18th of December 2015. Ahead of the opening, we are here uh, to gauge the mood of the residents and people who do businesses around to find out how they are preparing towards the grand reopening of the Adami Bridge. Yeah, we want to just have two takes. Yes. Be sure. yes. Um, the closure of the bridge created an avenue for you to also start your own businesses here uh, ahead of the opening. What are you considering? Do you have any options? Uh, actually, there are no any options. Uh, uh, always there's a beginning and there's an end. Uh, beautifully, they've done the bridge. Uh, we give glory to God first and then to the president as well and the people of Ghana for supporting this wonderful And that's all for now on Joy News Today. There's more news on myjoyonline.com.
All right. My name is Francisca Kakafosen. I'm grateful for your company. Bye-bye.